Welcome to those of you who are joining us on Zoom this afternoon. We will be with you in just a couple of minutes. Those of you who have, who have not done one of these lectures on Zoom before, I uh, just wanted everyone to know that the QA feature, which you should find either at the, along the bottom of your Zoom screen or at the top, uh, is where you can enter questions at any time during today's program. We're going to save all of those questions for the end of the formal remarks. And my colleague on the Education Committee, uh, Ruth, is going to then moderate the Q&A and read all of your questions. So you don't have to worry about how you look today. You will not be seen on screen and you don't need to talk, but please do put your questions in at any time uh, based on things that Virginia is talking about that you find intriguing or have questions about. Um, and then we'll, we should be able to get to all of the questions at the end of the prepared remarks. I'll be back to you around three o'clock. Just going to ask a question of my colleague Ruth. Ruth, if you can just keep an eye on the audience and about how many are, have entered and, and use your judgment, tell me if we should start right at three or a couple of minutes after as, as the clock approaches three o'clock. Let me know if we've got a critical mass of Zoom screens live or if we should wait just a few minutes. Okay, minutes. Eileen, you have about 24 right now. Okay, yeah. Okay. When we get to more like you know, over 40 active screens um, or 50, that's probably a good time to start. So a little after three, maybe okay. a couple minutes after. Thanks. For those of you who have just joined on Zoom, just a reminder that you should get comfortable. We'll start at three or a couple minutes after, uh, but do look for the QA feature on your Zoom screen, either at the bottom or the top, a button you can click on. That's where anytime during the program, you can type in a question. And after the formal remarks, 
Ruth will be um, handling the questions. She'll read all of them. Uh, we should have time to get to all of your Zoom questions. So as something occurs to you, no need to wait to uh, enter the question um, and we will get to them. But make yourselves comfortable. We'll start three o'clock or a couple minutes after. And we're right at three o'clock. Ruth, should we give it just a couple of minutes? You have uh, 41 attendees. I get people are still coming in. I give sure. it a couple okay. more minutes. Yep. Sure. So those of you who have just joined, welcome and we'll be with you shortly. Make yourselves comfortable and do get familiar with the Zoom screen and look for that QA feature for questions that you may want to enter at any time during the program today and we will get to them after the formal remarks. We'll be with you shortly. <laughs> 
and we'll get started in just another minute. For those of you who just came in and we did have a, a sudden rush of people entering the Zoom, uh, get comfortable, uh, check out your Zoom screen and find the QA feature either along the bottom or the top of your screen. And that's where you can type in a question at any time during today's formal remarks. And uh, Ruth Gilbert Whitner will be moderating all of that uh, after we finish the formal remarks. So we will get to all of the questions, but you don't have to worry about uh, speaking or, or what you look like today. You can just be comfortable uh, and uh, just be ready to uh, enter any questions that you have. And we'll be I mean, starting. you have uh, 49 yep. attendees right now at Great. this point. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to give another 10 seconds and get started. So be comfortable. Okay, our program will now begin. Welcome to our audience on Zoom. We appreciate you all joining us today. We're gonna to first hear from Paula Bagger, who is president of the Hingham Historical Society. Paula. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining us for the fourth lecture in this year's Hingham Historical Society lecture series, Native Homelands Settler Colonialism. And my video isn't on. There I am. There you go. All right. And I'm going to um, now we can really get started. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few notes on upcoming events and programs at the Society. This coming Tuesday, January 24th, we will be thanking our 2022 donors with a reception at the Benjamin Lincoln House. Those who gave charitably to the Society above and beyond their annual membership dues should have received an invitation. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Why January 24th? That's Benjamin Lincoln's 290th birthday, which we will be celebrating. On Saturday, February 11th, we invite the entire community to join us for the 46th annual Lincoln Day, where we gather every year to honor our 14th president, Abraham Lincoln, whose ancestors came from Hingham, our own Revolutionary War hero, Benjamin Lincoln, and civic engagement at the local and national level. This year, we welcome Abraham Lincoln biographer Ed Acorn as our speaker. Uh, the militias will muster at 1015 outside the old ship meeting house, and the inside portion of the program starts at 11. And I hope as many of you as possible can come. The next day, Sunday, February 12th, we continue our partnership with the Hingham Public Schools by hosting Hingham High School's National History Day competition. What's National History Day? Think of a national high school science fair, only all about history. We're excited that we will be able to host National History Day in person this year for the first time since February, 2020. So I hope you will watch your February uh, member newsletter for details on this and more. And thank you, as always, for your interest and support of the Historical Society. Thank you, Paula. And my name is Eileen McIntyre. And as a member of the board of the Hingham Historical Society, it continues to be my honor to chair the Education Committee, which brings you our annual lecture series. Later in today's program, we will be joined by another member of the Education Committee, Ruth Gilbert Whitner, who will moderate our Q&A after today's prepared remarks. As I mentioned earlier, you can enter questions at any time during the program using that Q&A box, and we will save them all for the conclusion of the formal program. We expect to complete the Q&A and end our program today at about 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you all for joining us. And before I introduce our guest speaker, there's something I want to show you. So I'm going to slide share again. So this is an historic marker on this slide that is located in Duxbury here on the South Shore. 
I first learned about this marker in Virginia Anderson's wonderful book, Creatures of Empire. The granite marker erected in 1940 reflects directly on the topic of today's program. When English settlers, Native Americans were living side by side and the settlers had a number of domestic animals that were roaming around. Uh, so I thought you'd be interested in seeing that. And there's some information on this slide about where it's located, but you can easily find it by Googling Nook Gate, Duxbury. What the sign says is site of Nook Gate. Here, a palisade was erected across the Nook in 1634. This palisade was a high fence to prevent cattle from straying and probably to keep the Indians out. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now so I can introduce our wonderful speaker. Professor Virginia Anderson received her BA summa cum laude from the University of Connecticut, and then as a Marshall Scholar, earned a Master of Arts degree from the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. She received another master's degree and her PhD from Harvard University. She is the author of three books, including Creatures of Empire, How Domestic Animals Transformed Early America, first published in 2004. This book was described by the Boston Globe as a, quote, most original and thoroughly fascinating, sorry, I just lost my place, thoroughly fascinating exploration of colonial history. And I have to agree, Virginia's topic is one that I had never given thought to until her work was brought to my attention. And it is so well researched and quite enlightening. Virginia recently retired from the Department of History at the University of Colorado Boulder, having taught there since 1985. And she joins us today from her home in Colorado. Good afternoon, Virginia, and welcome to our virtual auditorium. Oh, well, thank you, Eileen, and um, hello and, and to everyone out there who I can't see. Uh, greetings from Colorado. So uh, thanks so much, Virginia. Our format today is a conversation, and Virginia and I have talked previously to arrive at a series of topics that we'll discuss. So let's begin. European domestic animals, and we're talking about cows, oxen, pigs, sheep, goats, and horses were all new to North America and therefore quite surprising to the native peoples here when they were brought by English colonists and earlier horses, I understand, by Spanish uh, on the West Coast. So Virginia, tell me more about this influx of domestic animals. Okay, well, you're right that um, none of these creatures or none of these species lived in North America before Europeans showed up. There had been a prehistoric horse um, in North America, but it had died out 10, 12,000 years before colonists arrived. So these animals just didn't exist until Europeans showed up. And you can imagine how weird this was to native peoples who knew the land, knew the, the terrain, the animals and all, and suddenly these unusual creatures start showing up. Um, you know, they had to try to figure out what they were, where they came from, all this sort of thing. Um, and as time goes on, one of the other things that, that is going to seem strange to Native peoples is this whole notion that not only are these new species of animals, but they're domesticated animals. And this concept of domestication was not familiar to native peoples. Now they did have dogs um, who were sort of semi-domesticated. Uh, it's not clear whether they were owned by an individual native person or a family or just kind of lived in the village themselves. But on the whole, native peoples were unfamiliar with the notion of domestication. Um, when the colonists arrived, when the English colonists arrived, particularly in, uh, in New England, they saw this lack of domestic animals in native society as yet another index of uh, Indian barbarism, of savagery. You know, these people don't understand about, uh, you know, using animals. Uh, what the Europeans didn't realize, or the English didn't realize, is that there were no indigenous species of animals, certainly in the New England area at the time of contact, 
that would have been suitable for domestication. An animal, uh, a species to be domesticable uh, has to have certain characteristics. Um, uh, just a couple of them are the animal has to have or the species has to have a, a dominance hierarchy so that, uh, you know, like a alpha wolf, <laughs> so that the humans can um, insert themselves as the leader of the pack or also the animals have to be able to breed in captivity. And so there weren't animals that could be domesticated in the new world. So it's not that the Indians didn't bother to do it. It's just that they couldn't. So again, it's the creatures themselves are very strange to the native peoples, but also this category of domestication. And were the English colonists also surprised by some of the North American wild animals that they encountered? They were, um, and uh, they would write back home in uh, letters and journals about all the strange creatures they had never seen before. Uh, the ones that come to mind to me are hummingbirds. Uh, they thought were, were strange flying squirrels. They had squirrels in England, but not flying squirrels. Possums. They were just fascinated by possums uh, and the pouch. Uh, and so they just thought this was very, very strange. And um, moose were, were another uh, creature that the Europeans commented on. But even more than the kinds of animals, one of the things that really struck colonists about New World fauna um, was the abundance of wild animals. And they particularly focused on fish, partly because they wanted to make money fishing <laughs> in New England. But there were these comments going back to England about the fish were so numerous, you know, in the oceans and rivers that you could walk across the water on the backs of fish, or you could simply drop a basket in the ocean and lift it up and it would be full of fish um, or birds um, that they would describe flocks of birds uh, so thick that they would block out the sun. Um, scientists who have studied this have suggested those are probably passenger pigeons um, and they were hugely numerous. So it's um, some of the creatures are strange to the Europeans but it's also the abundance of uh, new world wildlife. And you write in your book that the native tribes named these new exotic creatures. How did you research the, the native animal names and what did you learn about the names that were given to creatures like pigs and cows? My main sources of information were, for you know, lack of any other ones, were English people um, talking about what Indians named um, these animals. But the two English individuals in particular that I'm thinking of are Roger Williams of Rhode Island, founder of Rhode Island, and also John Elliott, Reverend John Elliott, who was very much involved in setting up uh, villages to Christianize Indians. So these were two colonial leaders who were relatively sympathetic to Native peoples and intent on understanding Native peoples and to the extent to which they could do it, understanding Native languages. So what they did is compiled a uh, list of vocabulary um, that native peoples used. And also John Eliot wrote a grammar book, Indian grammar. And what their experience showed uh, in particular is initially what native peoples did is it looked at these imported creatures and tried to figure out what was the closest North American analogy to this new animal. So the best example of this comes from Roger Williams in his discussion of the Narragansetts. He says they looked at a pig and said, well, that's about as big as a woodchuck. Uh, it roots around in the ground like a woodchuck. So we'll use our word for woodchuck. Uh, and I can't pronounce it, but actually the Narragansett word for woodchuck is the origin of the word of woodchuck. If you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, the root of that word is Narragansett. Um, so they use this analogy um, say, OK, well, we'll call it something we're familiar with. And this, by the way, seems to have been a fairly common um, indigenous strategy in dealing with European animals. Um, there's been quite a bit of work done on the Nahuas in Mexico who use their word for deer to describe, to name um, Spanish horses. 
or actually my favorite example of this is um, when they saw Spanish sheep, they used the Nahua word for cotton because that was the closest thing they could see. Yeah. So the initial strategy is to use analogy, but eventually Indians came to realize these are really very different animals. They're not just like the ones we're familiar with. And so in recognition of that, they gave them new names. Um, and again, Roger Williams is key here where he says, you know, they used to call pigs and cows this and that, but now the Narragans Narragansetts call pigs pigsuck or hogsuck. Uh, a cow is cowsnuck. And what they're doing is attaching the English word for the animal to a native suffix, native vocabulary suffix. John Eliot in his Indian grammar says the suffix ag or uk was used by um, native peoples. It was added to the plural of nouns for animate beings. So it's a hybrid name that suggests this, you know, sense of these animals as hybrid and they're brought over, but they're accommodating themselves to the new world. So there's a shift in the names um, that native peoples used that suggested their understanding of these creatures really is different from the ones they were familiar with. Right. So you mentioned before that domestication was, was something that they were not familiar with for good reason, uh, but the concept of owning an animal, which is related to that, just like ownership of land was quite foreign to the native peoples. So how did Indians see or experience the ownership that the English colonists exercised over their animals? This is really one of the, the key elements here of um, cultural contact. Now, native peoples thought you could own a dead animal. You know, when a hunter killed a deer, that became the hunter's property um, that would be shared with the family, sometimes with the village. But the notion of owning a living animal, that's where things became complicated. And the way the native peoples confronted this or were confronted by this notion of living property and animals, unfortunately, uh, seemed to have come through conflict as much as anything else. So for instance, if native hunters going through the woods shot a cow or a pig, um, or if uh, a cow or a pig got stuck in a native trap, and died, <laughs> you know, um, you know, whether this happened accidentally or deliberately, what would happen is the English would come after the native hunters and ask for restitution, for destruction of property, okay? This is not the way, you know, would happen if a native person shot a native hunter shot a deer. So suddenly their native hunters are enmeshed in these um, laws about what you can and can't do with this animal property. And of course, these demands for restitution that the English are making, all this is gonna be adjudicated in English courts. This is where I got this information about this. Um, and so it's this notion of animals as living property that reinforced this idea that these creatures are really not like the native creatures we know. Um, I do wanna suggest though that at least at the start, there was some element of reciprocity, which is that if a native person encountered a cow or a pig or whatever rooting around in his cornfield, creating damage, the native person could ask English people for restitution. Um, and this, there are cases of this happening in the records. You can see it there. The problem is the native person had to go to the English court. It wasn't like the English person came to the native court. Um, and the other problem there was that the owner of the livestock had to be identified. Mm -hmm. And if the animal had come and gone, there's no way to do that. Um, but there was at least this one kind of element of reciprocity, as I say, early on. Uh, but it's in these kinds of encounters that native peoples are coming to terms with this notion that you can own a living creature.
and and really related to that, also foreign to their concepts of of living creatures, uh, the indigenous tribes were not. Uh, their thinking was not consistent with the English view of an ordered hierarchy or a great chain of being with humans at the top. Uh, Indians, by contrast, really considered animals to be powerful creatures deserving of respect. Um, so how did your research underscore this differing view of kind of the order of living creatures? Mm -hmm. The English view was largely shaped by Christianity, by the biblical story of God giving Adam and his descendants dominion over the creatures of the earth, um, which is clearly a hierarchical um, relationship. Um, the idea of the great chain of being, uh, I think, goes back to the ancient Greeks, but it sort of fits pretty well with the Christian notion of dominion. Um, and the idea of the great chain of being, you know, has actually God at the top, then humans, then animals, then I think it goes to plants and then minerals, but it's, it's this um, vertical uh, hierarchy um, where humans really are above, literally and in every possible way, animals. And as part of this, part of the Christian part of this is that whereas human beings had souls and had a spiritual component, animals did not. Mm -hmm. okay? There's nothing spiritual about animals in the sort of Christian view. Well, the native peoples had a very different concept of human-animal relations, which probably the best way to think about it is sort of horizontal rather than vertical, that they didn't draw a sharp distinction as the English did between humans and animals or humans and what were sometimes the better translation is other than human beings. Okay, so they're, they're, they're different, but they're not necessarily better or worse uh, than humans. So that's part of the difference between the native view and the English view, but also the native peoples believe that uh, animals could have a spiritual component, particularly prey animals like deer or bears. They had something that the native peoples, the native word in New England anyway, was Manitou, um, sort of spiritual power, spiritual protectors. Now the English, when you read their commentary on Manitou, they almost always translated it as God. So they said, oh, these Indians think deer are gods, bear are gods. That's not what they're saying. They're saying these animals have spiritual power, spiritual protectors, okay? And because native peoples thought that these um, animals were spiritually powerful, what they did is develop rituals, particularly linked to hunting, not exclusively, but mainly that, these rituals that had to be performed in order to appease the animal's spiritual protectors. In other words, that you would make overtures to the spiritual protectors and in return, you would, the protector would allow you to successfully hunt the animal. So these are things like um, killing the animal as expeditiously as possible so it doesn't suffer, butchering the animal according to a kind of ritual practice um, that you know, follows along from uh, you know, these, these assumptions about animal power. Or uh, the one the English comment on a lot is how you dispose of animal bones. Um, uh, oftentimes native peoples burned them to just to leave them lie around or the worst thing of all is throw them to dogs it was a utter desecration. Um, so again, this notion of, of animals is more on a plane, if you will, with human beings and also having spiritual powers that needed to be respected is a very different sense of, of animals than the English had. So you mentioned hunting. And so both the English colonists and the native peoples hunted wild animals. Uh, but uh, you point out in your book that their practices really were very different based on their different perspectives on animals. Uh, so how, how would you talk about that. Okay, well, you know, as I just said, native hunting practices incorpor incorporated all these rituals that, that continually demonstrated the native people's 
um, native hunters respect for their prey. You don't quite see that in the English practices of hunting. But another key difference that I really want to point out here about native hunting um, is it was part of their subsistence practices. If native peoples were going to eat meat, they were going to hunt it or trap it. Um, you know, they, they lived by hunting, fishing, agriculture, and gathering of wild plants. And they were very careful. Roger Williams tried to um, get some sense of this about um, how this, how native hunting occurred. And he describes, um, if I'm remembering this right, you know, that uh, native peoples would go through the, the woods and figure out where the deer went. They weren't necessarily even hunting yet, but where do the deer normally go? They would confine most of their hunting to the winter. So they're not killing fawns or pregnant um, does, you know, so that they had ways of hunting that would preserve the creatures that they depended on. Now, you turn to the English, and actually, I didn't find a huge amount of evidence that English colonists hunted. Okay. Um, and I think in part, as I'll mention uh, in a second, that's because they didn't have much experience hunting when they were in England. Um, they tended to hire Indians actually to hunt meat for them. But for the most part, these English are gonna be relying on their domestic animals for meat. Um, they were familiar with hunting practices from England, but only you know, by proxy because in England, hunting was an, a sport. And it was a sport of aristocrats and gentlemen who would often set aside parts of their enormous estates woodlands where the deer could run or the foxes or whatever. It was mostly more deer than foxes in this um, period as I understand it. But it was, as I say, it was a sport um, for, all, for the upper class. And in fact, at precisely this time, parliament in England is passing laws prohibiting lower class people from engaging in hunting, the so-called game laws with these the high penalties, you know, up to, I think, capital punishment for hunting, um, you know, deer, whether it's on a private estate or if it got onto your own land, uh, poaching animals, you know, was, that was not what lower class people were supposed to do. It was a sport for the rich. So the colonists are carrying these ideas to them, to the new world. They see Indian men out there hunting, and they just simply apply their idea and say, oh, these Indian men are engaging in sport. They're recreating. And they thought that this was actually pretty rotten because they also knew, the English also knew when they looked in Indian villages and in native villages, the women were there hard at work in the cornfields hoeing and weeding and, 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 and so on, you know, to grow the crops. Where these men are out gallivanting, you know, chasing after deer. What the English didn't understand is they were again trying to imply their own sense of the gender di division of labor onto native societies. They didn't understand that it was a different gender division of labor. Women took care of plants, men did the hunting. And so there are these comments in the records where the English are saying, oh, the women, Indian women are all overworked and the men are lazy, you know, layabouts, just, just having fun when they feel like it. Um, so uh, they really don't, the English really don't understand that, no, for native peoples, this is a subsistence practice. Um, and there's a kind of corollary here too that I just want to throw this in. Um, in good part because the English didn't see hunting as an essential, you know, as a, an essential part of subsistence. They didn't recognize that native peoples had any claim to ownership of woodlands where they hunted. They would grant that Indians could own their cornfields because they had invested labor in producing those fields. But the woodlands were open. And this sense of this land not being used by Indians 
contributed to the English assumption, and there are lots of these comments early on, oh, there's plenty of land here, more than enough for them and for us, because the English, again, are seeing all the woodlands as open for them, uh, and you know, not something that's essential to Indian subsistence. Interesting. Uh, so speaking of the land, um, in your book, you do discuss uh, the environmental changes due to the free range husbandry practiced by English colonists and the selective grazing of pigs and cows, what the pigs and cows would eat as they grazed. You write that, quote, not only not until the 19th century did most farmers keep close track of their livestock. So they grazed freely. So what was the environmental impact at the time? Okay, I want to begin this by, by emphasizing this notion of the colonists adopting uh, free range husbandry. And the reason I want to do that is to emphasize that that is not the way livestock were raised in England at this time. In England, you fenced in your animals and then raised your crops outside of the fences. With free range husbandry in the new world, you fenced in your croplands and let the animals pretty much go free. It's the reverse of the practice in England. And the main reason for this, the English didn't expect this to happen. They assumed they were gonna simply raise animals the way they'd always done it. They didn't realize that when they get to the new world, they, you know, there's a, in effect a labor shortage. They're not only growing crops and raising animals, they're building houses, they're building roads, they're building meeting houses. They're doing all sorts of other work that's necessary for creating villages in, in the woods. Um, so they don't have enough labor to also fence in their livestock, make sure they're fenced in on areas with good, good pasture. Now in New England, um, you couldn't actually let your animals run at large all the time. They'd freeze to death in the winter. So uh, there would be an effort to bring the animals back sort of to the home farm during the winter. And during the rest of the year, you might keep uh, dairy cattle, uh, oxen um, in town on a, the town common. I mean, I don't know whether Hingham has a town common. I grew up in Wethersfield, Connecticut, and there's a huge town green. Um, in, you know, down in the older part of the town, you know, every New England town had its common or its green uh, for these animals that you needed daily access to, dairy cattle again and oxen. But the other creatures, you know, just kind of went at large. Um, and so it's that kind of ranging around everywhere which creates the kind of environmental changes. Um, the livestock are competing with indigenous animals for food. They're going to the same places as deer and other uh, indigenous animals. And, you know, as I say, eating the same things. Uh, cows are a lot, you know, bigger and heavier and they're compacting the soil wherever they roam, which leads to erosion because when it rains, the, the water can't sink into the soil as well when it's been compacted. Uh, livestock also uh, introduced uh, at least very early on, they introduced uh, European weeds into the New World. I believe the wow. dandelion, for one, is a, is a European import, and it came out of the manure of cattle that had been fed hay that had been cut in England and brought over on those initial ships. Um, so the animals are, are making changes in the environment, but so too are the livestock owners because they're changing the environment to make it more suitable for their animals, uh, their, or their, also their crop lands. So the owners are cutting down woods, you know, so changing from woodlands into uh, cleared areas, um, getting rid of predator animals, bounties on wolves in particular, to get rid of wolves because they prey on animals. Um, and also later on, this doesn't happen right away, importing things like clover and other nutritious grain or nutritious grasses rather to begin to raise pastures that are uh, better for cattle. That doesn't, there's not a lot of that early on because they simply just are too busy <laughs> doing other things, but they're also changing, the owners are also changing the composition of the plant life. 
um, in New England. So those are some of the key uh, changes. Interesting. Um, so there, uh, in spite of this obvious reason for there to be some conflict between uh, the two groups, there were some efforts you mentioned made by both the English colonists and the native peoples to adapt, find ways to live together in harmony. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these efforts based on the research you did? Yeah, and this was an aspect of the project that I had to really concentrate on because the conflict is so obvious um, that you, you expect to find it. The cooperation, frankly, I didn't expect to find, um, but I did. And so to me, that was an interesting phase where the colonists and Indians are trying, the native peoples are trying to get along. One aspect of this has to do with fences. Uh, before Europeans showed up, Indians didn't have to fence their cornfields. Um, and when the English say, well, you're always complaining about our livestock getting into your cornfields, why don't you just fence them? And at least in some cases, native people said, well, we don't know how to make fences. That may have been a little bit disingenuous because they knew how to make palisades for defensive, you know, these uh, poles stuck in the ground for defensive purposes around villages. But at any rate, um, I found scattered references, particularly in the Massachusetts records of the Massachusetts legislature saying, okay, well, in these various towns, Townsmen, colonists are going to get together with Indians and show the Indians how to make fences and work with them making them. And then once the Indians learn how to do this, then we can expect them to make their own fences and keep them in good repair. But this notion of Indians and, and colonists working alongside each other was not something that I had really thought much about. Um, another effort to get along, which was doomed from the start was something that I saw in land deeds and some treaties where uh, it stipulated that indigenous peoples and colonists would share the woods, share the woodlands. The Indians could hunt there, the colonists could let their animals graze there. Um, as I expect you can see right off the bat, that was the problem right from the start. If you're hunting in the woods and you see some creature in the distance, you know, you're not gonna wanna walk up to it and find out is that a deer or a cow. You simply can't graze animals as property in a place where you're hunting. It just doesn't work. And so you get uh, later on, you know, appended to some of these deeds or, or treaties is, well, Indians can hunt in the same place where we're grazing our animals, but they have to check their traps every day you know, things that are unrealistic. Uh, also interesting, in some ways to me, the most interesting aspect of adaptation is the English were constantly pressuring Indians to have livestock, because that's, you know, that's what the English do. And some native groups did adopt livestock. Um, and the English were very excited about this. They saw it as an element of Native peoples moving from savagery to civilization, livestock ownership fit with this Christian notion of human dominion over animals. Uh, the idea that once Native peoples owned animals, they would stop wandering through the woods and have sedentary villages where they would stay put just like the English do. All this cultural baggage tied up to livestock ownership. So initially when Native peoples adopt animals, adopt livestock, the English are excited about this. But it became clear that when the colonists imagined Indians owning animals, they were assuming that the native livestock owners would focus on cattle. And those are the creatures that require the greatest amount of kind of human input. You know, again, they have to be sheltered in the winter, so you've got to build a barn or some sort of lean-to uh, for your animals. You have to gather hay so you have food for your cattle in the winter. Um, once the Indians had oxen, then those men, those lazy men would start plowing lands like good you know, English farmers did um, and let their wives you know, off the hook on uh, farming. So the English are conceiving of native peoples as choosing cattle, but the native peoples by a long shot preferred pigs. 
precisely because pigs didn't require all those sorts of changes and all that extra care. You could simply acquire pigs, let them run loose in the woods, and when you wanted to eat pork, you went and got your pig, you shot your pig. Um, one of the, um, this was fairly early on in my, my research, I was stunned to find that Metacom, or the English knew him as King Philip, uh, I don't know how many of people in the audience there have heard of King Philip. I assume many people well, have. Yeah. This King leader, Philip's War. Right. It, yeah, King Philip's War. Yeah. But I found, you know, this is like 10 years or so or more before the war, references to King, Pil King Philip having a herd of pigs. Hmm. And this notion of him owning livestock just kind of didn't fit with this older image I had of him. Uh, and what's also um, clear is once native peoples adopted pigs in particular, they became pretty proficient at it and would take pigs to market and sell them and sell them at a pretty good rate. And suddenly these English are going, wait a minute, you know, we didn't, we didn't plan on getting competitors here. Um, they didn't appreciate this sort of competition. So there were these efforts to adapt, whether it's fencing or joint use of woodlands and so on. But for the most part, uh, the cooperation consisted of getting native peoples to adopt English ways. Um, but there were these efforts at cooperation, which I think are worth recognizing. Yeah, as you talk about woodlands, and we hadn't talked about this question, but uh, because here I know uh, timbering, timber as, a, as an industry, you know, uh, clearing, land to get the wood for masts for ships and and wood for various parts often that would be exported back to England by the English colonists uh so this would diminish woodland so do, did you find anything in your research just about the loss of woodland being something that then the wild animals didn't have the same nearby places to roam yeah Is especially because that... yeah deer I you know, had have people explain this to me because I grew up in the suburbs, you know, but deer prefer what they call edge habitats right near the edge of the woods and the open areas. And so when you cut the woods, you're moving the deer further and further away uh, from the village. So that's certainly a, uh, a problem. Right. Um, so, so certainly lots of reasons for conflict in spite of these occasional things that you found of people working together. Do you think that, you know, major conflict was really unavoidable once the English colonists came with their attitudes uh, and practices being so different? Uh, I hate to think it was unavoidable, but, you know, I can only see that it would have been if colonists had accepted changes to their own behavior instead of demanding always that the native peoples do it. Um, you know, I began this project as a, as a history of colonial New England agriculture. And as I began my research, I was finding a lot more in the colonial records on livestock than crop farming. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll follow that. But I found that almost any time livestock were mentioned in the records, Indians were as well. And that it was problems with livestock, particularly trespass. That's a huge uh, piece here. So I shifted the whole focus of the book. Uh, to why is there this friction over livestock? And I want to emphasize, the English didn't bring their animals to irritate the Indians. <laughs> you know, they brought them because that's how you farm in England. That's how you survive. That's the sort of meat you eat comes from cows and pigs. That's where you get your dairy. They're a crucial component of English subsistence, but you know, when the English are conceiving of bringing these animals over again, and initially they're thinking they're gonna raise them in the same way that they did in England, but they can't. And it's this free range husbandry. These animals are not under the dominion of the English settlers. That's where the problems uh, begin. You know, free range husbandry in this labor short um, economy. Uh, trespass is probably the number one source of friction between native peoples and, um, and uh, the colonists. You know, it's all over the place. Uh, and there's a corollary to this too. When the animals are ranging freely, they're ranging on native grasses, you know, whatever grows out there. 
And that, in general, was less nutritious than the kinds of pastures that were being raised specifically to feed cattle or sheep in, um, in England. And so to adequately feed a cow or something like that in the New World on free range uh, land, you needed a lot more land. I've seen estimates that you need five to 10 times more area for the animal to graze if it's free range of, than otherwise. So this leads the English livestock owners to say, we need more land, more land, more land. I was stunned to see towns that had, New England towns with 50 families suddenly saying, we don't have enough land. They've got this huge land grant. I'm going, what, what do you mean you don't have enough land? But you read their reasons as we don't have enough for grazing for our animals. So the English ultimately, you know, begin to demand virtually unlimited access to, to land from the native peoples uh, for the colonists and their animals. And as the native, uh, as excuse me, as the English population is growing rapidly and the native population is diminishing uh, because of disease and other factors, the colonists' willingness to cooperate, those, those efforts I mentioned earlier, begin to diminish. And this can be summed up in a way um, with coming back to Medicom and King Philip. Uh, right before that war, uh, a Rhode Island Quaker, John East, Easton, I think his name was, went out to Medicom. He's like, you know, what are your grievances? What are your problems? And you know, get, Medicom had a whole list of them. But one, and this is these are John Easton's words, his translation, but he said, Medicom said, even if we, the Indians, the native peoples, remove 30 miles from where the English had anything to do, they, um, the native peoples, could not keep their corn from being spoiled. We can't get away from your animals. And he went on and said, we thought when we sold you land, you would keep your animals on your own land. Hmm. And, you know, people have read John Easton's thing for a long time, but, but nobody really paid attention to that livestock one, but coming at it, through my other work, I'm like, whoa, you know, here is, is this huge piece of this. So conflict was all but unavoidable. How's that for a weasel, yeah. weasel so, response? So this also, what you're just talking about, gets into the next question, which is you posit in your book that livestock should have a place in the American history narrative because they served as the advance guard and the primary motive for Western expansion. So how did your research lead you to this specific belief? Well, I saw the same pattern over and over and over again. The book Creatures of Empire is actually a comparative study of New England with the Chesapeake uh, in the 17th century. The exact same thing is happening down there, although it's worse in the Chesapeake because it's warmer and you have large populations of feral livestock, which you don't really get in uh, New England. So that just compounds the problem. But, you know, you find colonists arrive with livestock, turn to free range husbandry because of the labor problems. They insist that native peoples respect proper, the uh, colonist property in their animals. Then they start demanding more land, put pressure on native peoples to get out of the way. This it goes over and over and over again. In fact, I found examples mostly um, in the Chesapeake, but some in New England, where the animals are in fact um, weaponized. You know, the colonists send their swine or send their horses or send their cattle deliberately into Indian villages, figuring they will become so much of a nuisance, the native peoples will just pack up and leave. Um, and then, you know, I, I did a kind of cursory look because the book focuses on the 17th century. Same thing happens when in the post-revolutionary period, when colony or Euro-Americans are crossing the Appalachians into Kentucky, into Ohio, uh, and so on, same thing. You know, colonists come out there, the animals go out there, they kind of establish a presence on the land, creating friction with the Indians. The e Indians either, you know, pack up and move on or there's, there's conflict over it. But you know, the, the Europeans, Euro-Americans are moving as much because they need land for their animals as for themselves. So it's this pattern just over and over and over again. Uh, it, it's just central, I think, to 
um, westward expansion. It's not just people, it's these creatures as well. Um, and so ultimately, I mean, I ended the book with um, this, this sense that uh, native peoples found room in their world for livestock in certain ways. I mean, not necessarily in the ways the Euro-Americans wanted, but ultimately colonists and their descendants and their livestock could find no room in their world for Indians, for native peoples. Yeah. Even though it was the native peoples who, who had the land that was being taken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very interesting to, to view colonial history, um, settler colonialism through this lens of, of domestic animals and, and really appreciate you taking us through this. Um, I suspect that there are some questions from the audience and I'm going to uh, leave uh, Virginia on screen, but I'm gonna turn off my screen for now and let Ruth join you uh, to take you uh, to, to take Virginia through some questions from our audience. Great. Okay. And thank you so much, Virginia. That was just fascinating. And you have three questions in the Q&A right now. And those of you who have other questions, please put them in there and we'll be happy to address those for you. Okay, the first one, it's a long one. So um, given your discussion about the differences that native peoples and colonists had very different attitudes and beliefs about the relationships between people and other living things, I am curious about the conclusion that the reason that native peoples did not domestic animals, domesticate animals, was that there were no animals suitable for domestication. It seems that these differences in human animal relationships would be a more compelling explanation for the differences in domestication practices. Could you speak about this, please? Okay, that, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I, I was reading animal behavior people and so on. And, and if any of you are familiar with Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel was another uh, place where I got this. Um, the, the question is um, whether had there been uh, domestic, domesticable animals that native peoples wouldn't have done it uh, because of their beliefs, it, that's the great unknown, or whether because they couldn't, they were able to maintain their uh, beliefs about um, animals as other than human people, or other than human creatures that uh, deserve respect. It, it is in some ways an unanswerable question, but it's a very good point. Uh, to bring up. I mean, it, it's, it's unclear whether they would have. I mean, again, dogs uh, are um, really the principal domesticated animal poultry in like Mexico, turkeys. Yes. Um, but I don't know of any other examples of native peoples doing this. So it's a good thing. Are they doing it because they can't or because they won't? Yeah, good. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, did the English brand animals to identify their animals for their neighbors? Yes, um, they did more earmarks than branding. Um, and uh, there, I mean, there's probably more of this in the book than there should be. Uh, but there are a slew of laws about hog thieves um, in particular that you know, you put a clip in, in, in a, a hog's ear and then you're a thief and you just put a different clip in there and then how do you know? Um, that uh, uh, they, they used earmarks um, and branding for cattle mostly. What's interesting is the Christian mission village of Natick in Massachusetts, John Elliott was, you know, brought about. They adopted English ways as well as Christianity and were given a town brand for native Indian um, animals. Um, as time went on, the, uh, I believe this is true in New England as well as in the Chesapeake, when the English became concerned about native hog raisers competing with them in the market, they would pass laws that would prohibit Indians from having earmarks for their animals. That's how you could tell it was a native pig. On the other hand, those were ripe for the picking from an English thief. All you had to do is get a 
unearmarked pig and mark the ears. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they did do that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, this question you should know the answer to, no problem. Would you give us the name of your book? <laughs> Creatures of Empire. Uh, what's the subtitle? How Domestic Animals Transformed Early America. Um, Oxford University Press had initially wanted How Domestic Animals Conquered uh, North America, and I felt a little uncomfortable with that, um, mm -hmm. but it's sort of what I end up arguing. <laughs> right, great. Okay, thank you. Um, would you please say the spiritual relationship between natives praying to animals would equate to Catholics praying to saints? Uh, no, they didn't pray to animals. It was appealing to the um, spiritual protectors of the animals. Mm. What, rather than Catholics praying to saints, one of the things I found, I didn't really want to get into this because it's kind of gnarly, but I'll just bring this up, is in addition to Christianity and the great chain of being and everything, there was also this undercurrent in this early modern English society of folklore about animals. Animals as bad luck symbols, animals that you could tell the weather from what animals were behaving. And it was very fuzzy whether it was the animal that knew what the weather was or, or, or not. That could have almost been a point of contact, except mm -hmm. that at the moment of colonization, particularly in England, um, the Protestant Reformation was trying to stamp out that older folklore. And so anything about animals is kind of with the quasi spiritual component was subsumed under witchcraft um, and thereby, you know, sort of denigrated. And so that becomes a, that also becomes a problem with native peoples because they're, they are accused of worshiping the devil and, and, and so on. So that's where that crossover comes. But I read a lot about weird um, English folklore about animals. Great, okay, thank you. Um, one of our audience would like to know, what are you working on now and how did you arrive at the topic? Uh, I'm retired. Um, I yeah, am but. <laughs> trying to put together a book. It's been uh, slowed down by the pandemic as everything has been. One of the, I do mention this guy in Creatures of Empire. His name is Daniel Gukin. And he was a prominent um, um, settler in Massachusetts, but he was also one of these Atlantic figures sort of looking at, at colonial history in an Atlantic perspective is a, um, it's not that new a trend. It certainly was the um, uh, close to the heart of my graduate advisor, Bernard Balin. Um, but this guy, Daniel Gukin was a Atlantic figure that, you know, he was born in England, but lived in Ireland. His father had um, an estate in Ireland. Then he went to Virginia. Uh, he was a Puritan, didn't feel comfortable in Virginia. Then he went to Maryland, which is, seems weird because it's a Catholic colony, but um, there was religious toleration there so that the Catholics would be tolerated. He's there a year or so, doesn't like it, goes to Massachusetts. He, um, so he's this kind of figure that circulates around the Atlantic world. What I wanna do though is look at him in the context of all the people who follow in his wake, he brings um, servants from Ireland, they're English, they're not Irish, but brings servants from Ireland to Virginia, some of whom are killed in Indian attacks. You know, did these people ask to come to America? You know, Gukin was a voluntary migrant. Um, he has, Gukin has uh, African enslaved Africans some of whom he has in Maryland, he takes to Massachusetts. And then in Massachusetts, he's got this kind of split personality. He is a defender of the Christian Indians. He gets death threats for defending Christian Indians during King Philip's War. And at the same time, he is very much involved in enslaving non-Christian Indians and sending them off to the Caribbean. So I wanna use him as a way to look at this Atlantic world and complicate the story of the kind of more familiar voluntary English immigrant with all the involuntary immigrants that follow in their wake. And also in the case of Gukin, to look at um, religion as a factor in understanding um, slavery. 
right? How do you spell his last name? G-O-O-K-I-N. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Was there conflict in regard to fishing right to waterways between the colonists and the Native Americans? There was um, mainly in rivers where the English wanted to build dams. And also later on when they're beginning to build mills that uh, block off uh, rivers for that. It's, it's more, it's a, sort of the Massachusetts, New Hampshire border, the ones I'm more familiar with sort of at the turn of the 18th century. Um, but yes, over access to um, fisheries. They're not as much in for ocean fishing. Although, um, oh gosh, I read this a long time ago. Um, Native peoples used to harvest beached whales, um, but then there became sort of conflicts over who actually owned the beached whales and then a move into the actual whale fishery that Native peoples were very much involved with. Great. Well, Virginia, thank you so much. Those are the questions that I have in the Q&A. Uh, we really appreciate your thorough answers and I'm gonna turn it back to Eileen. Eileen, you're muted. Okay, you can hear me now and you can see me now. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Virginia. Uh, as I said at the outset, this is a topic I had no reason to think about and you have so uh, done such a great job of researching it. Your book uh, is available uh, at the Hingham Historical Society uh, for anyone who wants to, to get it there. Um, and it's very readable, uh, very accessible. Uh, sometimes academic books can be really tough to uh, get through for someone who's a more casual reader of this history, but it's really a, a delightful read and really just fascinating. And, and as, um, as you heard from Virginia, there were a lot of things that she didn't really get into that are covered in the book. So lots more that you can explore there. Uh, thank you, not only to Virginia, but thanks to the audience for the great questions and for your attentiveness. Uh, really appreciate that. We hope that you can all join us again in March for our fifth program in our Native Homeland series. We'll be pleased to welcome as our speaker on Sunday, March 26th, Jean O'Brien, who is a prof professor of history at the University of Minnesota, whose presentation will be based on her book, Firsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England. So that should be another really thought-provoking program and hope to see all of you then. This concludes today's program. So good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you all. Thanks, Virginia.